I'm so glad you were with us today. Welcome to Mariner's Church. If we haven't met, my name is Eric. I am the senior pastor here. This is Palm Sunday weekend. It's an important weekend. Christians remember that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and people started celebrating saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save us now. They really were looking for Jesus to start a political revolution and save Israel now from Roman oppression. But Jesus came for another mission. He came for a greater rescue. And that's what we get to celebrate next weekend. We are gonna have online, Mariners Online, Good Friday services. We're gonna remember that Jesus offered himself for us on the cross to bring salvation to us. That's the better rescue. I hope you'll join us for Mariners Online on Friday. And then on Saturday and Sunday, we're going to have our Easter services. And if you're in Southern California, I invite you to join one of our physical locations. If you are part of Mariners Online outside of Southern California, I hope you'll join us. No matter who you are watching right now, share the link with friends, invite people to be a part of us celebrating that Jesus is alive. This weekend, we are wrapping up our teaching series in Song of Solomon. It's a book in the Bible about your love life, We've seen this couple, they were attracted to each other, they pursued one another, they've been married, and now at the end of the book, we're gonna see an incredible vision for love. Now, if you're single and you desire to get married one day, I think this is gonna be really helpful because you're gonna see God's vision for what marriage really should be. And for those of us who are are married, I think this is gonna be helpful too because we're gonna see how this couple really grows together. As a pastor, I have officiated weddings, some that are simple and some that are swanky. I was pastor in Miami for a season and there was multiple weddings that were super swanky. One of them was at this really historic place. There were celebrities and Chilean sea bass and filet mignon and the DJ from the Miami Heat mixing. I mean, it was awesome. It was super fun. And then I've officiated some really simple weddings that, that were not that. In fact, that's how Kay and I, our wedding was really simple when I asked her dad, if I could marry her, he said yes. And he said, I'm gonna give you an amount for your wedding and whatever you don't spend on the wedding, you can keep. And I was like, yes, this sounds all, I was expecting this major, uh, this big amount. He says, I'm gonna give you, and he said it like it was a lot, $5,000. And so Kay and I were, were like, wow, can we save some money? We are really young. Um, we're still in college at the time. And we decided to, to go as, as economical as we could on the wedding. She borrowed a wedding dress. We had some ladies in the church do the reception for us, which was in the fellowship hall. So right after we were married in the church building, walked over there two o'clock in the afternoon. So nobody was expecting dinner at all. The ladies put together these pimento cheese and tuna fish sandwiches, and they, they cut them in little triangles and put toothpicks with flags on them to make them look um, you know, really fancy. And the total price for this wedding $2,200, that's all we spent, $2,200. Kay borrowed the wedding dress from her sister-in-law. We saved 2,800 bucks, which may not sound like a lot of money, but we were renting a house from a man in the church, an older man who loved us. He was the bank president in town, and he only charges 250 bucks a month for rent, 3K a year. We almost saved enough money for our whole first year of rent to be covered which, I mean, we've been married 27 years, 2,200 bucks on a wedding. That's a killer ROI. That's big time. Yo, come on now. Less than 100 bucks a year so far on our, for the wedding. And I mean, it was, it was awesome. So simple wedding, swanky wedding. I don't, I'm not against the swanky weddings, by the way. I've had a blast at those. I'm not knocking the swanky weddings. But those who get married at a simple wedding or a swanky wedding, we would agree, both of us that more important than the wedding is the marriage. It's actually much easier to plan and execute a wedding than it is to live a marriage and to grow together as a couple. And more than we want a beautiful wedding, we want a beautiful marriage. And we're gonna see an incredible vision of a beautiful marriage in this passage. In fact, the verse that we're gonna see in chapter eight, which is the last chapter in Song of Solomon, we're gonna see verse six and seven. This is the verse that Kay and I put on our wedding invitations that we sent out to people. 
which we were a little perplexed by because that was gonna cut into the 5K that we were given to have to mail out wedding invitations, but we knew we'd get some gifts in return, so it was all good. And here is what the verses on our wedding invitation read. It's a vision for love. The scripture says, and this is this married couple speaking to each other, set me as a seal on your heart, as a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death. Jealousy is as unrelenting as Sheol. Love's flames are fiery flames, an almighty flame. A huge torrent cannot extinguish love. Rivers cannot sweep it away. If a man were to give all his wealth for love, it would be utterly scorned. This is the word of the Lord. I want you to notice in this passage, some really beautiful statements that the couple makes to one another about their desire for their love to be irreversible. I mean, they are making huge statements here that their commitment to one another cannot be reversed. Notice the passage we read, to set me as a seal on your heart. At this point in history, this language would be as a king who has a ring sealing a document and the king's edict could not be reversed. And so they are saying to one another, we want our love to be irreversible. You can also see this in the next phrase. Love is as strong as death. Death is irreversible. Everyone who dies, they, they are not brought back in this life. It's irreversible. And they're saying, we want our love to be that strong that it is unending, that it cannot be reversed. They even speak about being jealous for one another, a, a, a holy jealousy, not jealous of each other, but jealous for each other, the way that God is jealous for us. He's not jealous of us, but because he longs for us, he's jealous for our affections and attention. And this is the kind of love that they have. They also say that <clears throat> love's flames are fiery flames and you can't extinguish love. They are speaking to one another saying, we are going to face trials and we have faced trials in our life, but the trials aren't gonna extinguish, extinguish the love that we have for one another. And then this is an old school version of money can't buy love. This is what the scripture says. All his wealth for love, that would be utterly scorned. Essentially, our love for each other is worth more than wealth. That wealth compared to the love that we have for, for each other, that wealth is scorned, that our love is so deep. So this is really a beautiful picture of a couple who is deeply committed to one another. It's a vision of love for one another. Now, that is the end, chapter eight. And what I wanna do over the next couple moments is show you how they actually got there. So it's one thing to have a vision for love. It's one thing to have a vision for your marriage to be beautiful. It's one thing if you desire to get married one day to, to really desire that type of commitment with somebody but it's another to work at it, to really grow in your relationship. And you're gonna see in the wisdom literature that we're gonna look at right now, how the couple actually gets there. And it's really wise instruction that we see in this passage. I've been married now for 27 years and multiple times in my marriage, Kay has given me a book of marriage, like a book about marriage. And when she does, it's always a little, it's always a little offensive. Like I'm thinking, oh no, what am I supposed to notice in this book? You know what, I'm, I'm wondering, did she highlight a, a, a section? Is there a certain page that she really wants me to read? And one of the books that she gave me to read early in our marriage was a book called The Five Love Languages. Now it's a famous book about expressing love to one another, essentially that you as a husband or as a wife need to find out what your spouse's love language is because everyone has a way in which they hear that they are accepted, approved, and loved, and they may have a love language that's different than yours. And if you only try to communicate to the person in your language, they may miss that you actually love them. So the five love languages are time, touch, words of affirm affirmation, gifts, and acts of service. And so my, my job as a husband is to find out which which of those five does Kay most value? And then I should express love to her in the language that she most receives. It's really helpful. And in Song of Solomon, you actually see three of those five love languages in the verses preceding this vision of love that we just read in chapter eight. 
you're going to see that the couple's telling one another that they love each other. You're going to see that they touch one another. There's lots of physical touch in the Song of Solomon and that they spend time with one another. And so really they're committed to, I'm not saying that all five aren't important, but these three are really pronounced in this chapter. So let's start with telling. Here's what the scripture says. This is Song of Solomon, chapter seven, verse one through five. The man is telling the woman how much he loves her, how he values her. Notice his words. How beautiful are your sandaled feet, princess. The curves of your thighs are like jewelry, the handiwork of a master. Your navel is a rounded bowl. It never lacks mixed wine. Your belly is a mound of wheat surrounded by lilies. Your breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Your neck is like a tower of ivory. Your eyes like pools in Heshbon by Bathrobim's gate. Your nose is like the tower of Lebanon looking toward Damascus. Your head crowns you like Mount Carmel, the hair of your head like purple cloth. A king could be held captive in your tresses. Okay. This clearly is poetic language because I asked an artist in our church to actually draw exactly what this passage says, and here is the depiction. And so I'm telling you guys, do not draw a picture like this and take a woman out to the Waffle House on a date and slide the picture across and say, baby, this is what you look like. It would not, it would not work. I mean, notice the picture. Let's actually zoom in a little bit. I mean, see, I mean, your nose is like a tower. You got a, you got a really big nose. You've got um, a, a belly of wheat, a navel that is rounded, purple hair. You have this neck that is also a tower. You have gazelles. I mean, this is definitely really poetic language. And, and we'll see a couple of things that this man is saying to the woman. This is all big time compliments. Now, one thing that scholars note, notice is that he begins with her feet. Earlier in Song of Solomon, when he first was attracted to her, he began with her face, but now he begins with her feet. And so scholars say that this is a deeper love, that they've been married and they are committed to one another. And by beginning with her feet, he's saying, I am, I'm, I've bowed before you. He, he's in a servant's posture, perhaps washing his wife's feet, serving her, and he is marveling over her feet. He starts with her feet. And husbands, this is what the scripture says, that we should be to our wives, that we should love our wives and serve our wives the way that Christ has loved us and served us. So he begins with her feet and he's marveling over, but he then later moves up other parts of her body. Now this gets really explicit. The, the passage that we just read, if, when you really understand the meaning, it is, is one reason we encourage people to have their kids watching something else during Song of Solomon. This is a very explicit passage on an Instagram poll a couple of months ago, a couple of weeks ago, I asked when we got to this passage, do you want me to explain what the text means or to kind of cover over it? And 95% of you said, please give it to us like it is. But I'm so concerned that um, it could be perceived like I'm just trying to be edgy when I really just want to explain the text. And I'm actually going to just read what some of this passage means. So here we go. I want to be honoring of scripture, but also honoring of those of you who are listening. When this text says your navel is a rounded bowl. He is not asking if her belly button is an innie or an Audi. He is talking about something different than the navel. He's speaking about the area near the navel. Scholars say navel is actually an inaccurate translation. And he's saying that the area near the navel is like mixed wine and her belly is like wheat. He's essentially saying, I feast on your body that I'm so in awe of your body that I feast on it. He then speaks of her neck being noble and strong and her head crowning her in royalty and beauty. He is captivated by her. And so the verses that we just read, chapter seven, verse one through five, the man is telling the woman how captivated he is by her. He is complimenting her. As you read Song of Solomon, we notice this in the very first week, the woman speaks more than the man in the book, but when it comes to compliments, the man compliments the woman more than the woman compliments the man. And some scholars point out that likely that means that 
women need to be complimented more by their husbands than husbands need to be complimented by their wives. That we make mistakes, husbands, when we think that our wives only need to be complimented the same amount of time that we need to be complimented, when in fact, they've been wired by God and created by God in such a way that they need to be complimented more than we need to be complimented. Perhaps you've seen this. You can make jokes. Us guys, we can make jokes with each other. I've seen this with friends for years. You can say to a dude, you can say to a guy, bro, how did you get your wife? I mean, you way outkicked your coverage. I mean, she is way better looking than you, smarter than you. How in the world did you get that sweet woman to marry you? You can say that to a dude and the dude will be like, yeah, bro, that's legit, man. I don't even know, man, so good. Like that's a compliment to the guy. You cannot say that to a woman. You cannot say to a woman, man, how'd you get him? You can never say that to a woman. Women and men are different in their need of compliments according to this couple in Song of Solomon, which means husbands, we should be the chief complimenters of our wives, that they must hear from us, us praising them and adoring them and honoring them. This is what you see in this passage. And it's really what makes marriage beautiful the longer that we are married, where you even compliment the idiosyncrasies in the person. It's what makes marriage even more sweet the longer you're married. I, I, I won't give you a lot of case idiosyncrasy. Those are for me just to marvel over and be in awe over, but I'll give you one that is just beautiful to me and sweet to me. For 27 years of being married, whenever Kay gets up, and it, she might need to go check on a kid or, uh, handle something or plug her phone in. Whenever she gets up from bed, even if she just three minutes before went to the restroom, went to the bathroom and got in bed, if she gets up, she has to go to the bathroom again. It's, it's like a habit. She always has to go to the bathroom right before she gets back in bed. And so I'll hear her go back to the bathroom again and I'll be in bed and I'll just smile and chuckle because I just think it's so cute. And for 27 years, I've seen that. And I, it's the idiosyncrasies of a husband complimenting his wife and a wife complimenting her husband that really fosters an appreciation for one another. And you see that with this couple, they are telling each other how much they love one another. Okay, and then we get to touch. So they, there's telling and then there's touching. Look at chapter seven, verse six. This is verse six through 10. How beautiful you are and how pleasant my love. With such delights, your stature is like a palm tree. Your breasts are clusters of fruit. <clears throat> I said, I will climb the palm tree and take hold of its fruit. May your breasts be like clusters of grapes and the fragrance of your breath like apricots. Your mouth is like fine wine. And the woman finishes the sentence. This is the only time this happens in the entire book. They, they've been together so long, they finish one another's sentences. It's awesome. Your mouth is like fine wine. The woman chimes in flowing smoothly from my love, gliding past my lips and teeth. I am my love's and his desire is for me. She is so secure in the relationship that she says, I am his and his desire is for me. She is not concerned that she is married to a man with a wandering eye or someone who's flirty with other people at work. She knows that she belongs to him and that he belongs to her. And that is the foundation for the free sexual expression that you see between the two in their relationship. You actually also note that in the passage we just read that sex between this married couple is more expressive than it was on their honeymoon night in chapter four, which scholars point out could suggest that sex with this couple actually got better over time, which is really encouraging. Because if you didn't have an amazing honeymoon night, it doesn't mean that sex isn't gonna get better in the relationship. In fact, oftentimes couples put too much pressure on themselves for the honeymoon night to be something that they've, been, they've heard about or they imagine. The good news is if you're gonna be married together for decades till death do us part, that sex will get better over time. And this is what happens with this couple. They are telling each other they love each other. They are touching one another. There's free sexual expression in the commitment of this monogamous relationship between a husband and a wife. 
and their security and their commitment for one another serves as the foundation for them to be so expressive towards one another sexually. She feels so secure with him. He feels so secure with her. And therefore the telling and the touching intermingle. And then we move on to time. Now we are in verse 11. And the woman says this, come my love, let's go to the field. Let's spend the night among the henna blossoms. Let's go early to the vineyards. Let's see if the vine has budded, if the blossom has opened, if the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my caresses. The mandrakes give off a fragrance and at our doors is every delicacy, both new and old. This woman instigates with the man to spend time with one another. I mean, notice, she says, come my love, let's go, let's go on a date. I, I really love when Kay does this with me. Now, I, I, Kay prefers when I'm the one who sets up dates. She does. She prefers when I say, hey, on Tuesday night, I've already made us reservations. I, let's go here. And so that's, that's what she prefers. And that's what I should do. But when I fail in that, I love how easy Kay makes it for me. She's, she's like this woman in Song of Solomon. She'll say, come on, let's go to the apricot field. <laughs> She'll say, come on, I, I made us reservations on, on Tuesday or, or on Wednesday, which is better for you? I'll cancel the one that's not best for you. Instead of, she's never done this to me. And I've heard of some women that do this and Kay's never done this. Instead of saying something like, you never pursue me anymore. You're such a loser husband. I never feel valued by you. Why don't you take me on a, on a date like a real man? Would? She would, she's never said that. In 27 years of marriage, she's never said something like that to me. And when I drop the ball, instead, she makes it easy for me to pick up the ball and go on a date. Now, she prefers when I am the one who instigates, and I should. I mean, husbands, we should. We, we're, we're not idiots. We're skilled. We knew how to pursue the woman that we are married to when we first went after their heart. We knew how to set them up on a, how to set a date up. We knew how to win them to ourselves, to woo them. We knew how to impress them. And then some kind, sometimes in our lives, we just lay those skills aside and we need to pull those skills back up and pursue our wives. But in this passage, the woman is actually pursuing as well and they spend time with one another. As they are spending time with one another, we get to chapter eight. And in chapter eight, you're gonna see that everything is really interwoven, that this couple is experiencing real life, that the telling, the touching, and the time, they're not segmented in real life, meaning we don't have moments where let's tell each other, and then now let's have moments where we touch, and now let's have moments where we spend time, that really it's all interwoven with one another. Because in chapter eight, you're gonna see that their date, their going away together actually becomes very, very sexual. They spend time with each other and they touch one another. She says this, chapter eight, verse one. If only I could treat you like my brother, one who nursed at my mother's breast, I would find you in public and kiss you and no one would scorn me. I would lead you, I would take you to the house of my mother who taught me I would give you spiced wine to drink from the juice of my pomegranate. May his left hand be under my head and his right arm embrace me. Young women of Jerusalem, I charge you, do not stir up or awaken love until the appropriate time. She's saying, I want, I want to treat you like my brother. What is she saying? In this culture, public displays of affection were looked down upon and she so desires him that she says, I wish you were, I could treat you like I treated my brother because a family could walk and hold hands. A family could walk and be intermingled. But because you're not my brother, I'm looked down upon if I show public displays of affection to you, but I'm longing for you so much that I, I wish even publicly, I just, I'm, you're irresistible to me, she's saying. And then she speaks really intense graphic language about her desire for them to be together once again sexually. And I'm going to once again read. She says she wants to give him spice drink from the juice of her pomegranate. Scholars believe the pomegranate to which she refers is part of her body and not a fruit separate from her body. Kay has vetoed every other comment I have about this verse. 
All that to say, there is a deep passion and a sexual longing in this verse, so much so that the woman has to remind the young women who are listening, don't stir this up until the right time. But this is the right time for me because I am my beloved and he is mine. We are married and we're on a date and he is telling me that he loves my neck and my nose. So for me, the time is now. And they engage once more in sexual union. The Christian sexual ethic you can clearly see in this text is not repressed. It is not prudish. It is a couple that is joining intimacy with one another. And the reason that God desires sex to be so beautiful in this marriage between a man and a woman is because sex is not only about sex. Sex is union. It's the full uniting of a couple in a marriage relationship. And marriage isn't only about marriage. Sex isn't only about sex, sex is union. And marriage isn't only about marriage. Marriage gives a beautiful picture of the gospel to a world that is watching. The reason that God has a beautiful vision for marriage in the scripture is because marriage, and this is why our marriages are so important, isn't only about us. Our marriage gives a picture to the world about God's love for people, that God unites us to himself by what Jesus did for us on the cross. And we who have believed in Jesus are forgiven and we are made one with God. Marriage gives a picture of the gospel, which is why us husbands and us wives, we want our marriages to be growing and strong and beautiful because our marriage isn't only about us. Our marriage preaches to the world how much God loves us. So married couples, the assignment for you this week is to increase your telling, your touching, and your time with one another because as you grow in your marriage, you send a beautiful picture to the world about how much God loves people. Now, perhaps in this teaching series, you have seen this vision for love that God gives us in Song of Solomon and your heart is is disappointed because you don't have this. Or maybe you've been hurt in a relationship or maybe right now in, In your marriage, it feels so far from this. This feels so ideal. Well, here's the real, raw, honest truth is that this is really ideal. In fact, Solomon, who wrote this, either about him and the woman that he is married to or about just the ideal love among God's people, there's scholars with both of those viewpoints, but they agree that Solomon wrote this Solomon who wrote the scripture, ultimately God's inspiring it, but Solomon is the human writer of what we've been studying. Solomon doesn't live up to the ideal that he wrote about. Solomon ends his life, not in a relationship with one wife in a commitment like we've read about, but he has lots of wives and concubines and his life has become an absolute mess. At one point, he was called the wisest man in the world. And he ends his life worshiping a bunch of little G gods instead of the one true God. He he wrote about an ideal love between a man and a woman. And he ends his life with being unfaithful and having concubines and lots of wives. And he lives, he ends his life so far from this. So what does this tell us? It tells us that all of us fall short of the ideal. Now, falling short of the ideal doesn't mean the ideal is wrong. It shows that we've fallen short of the ideal. Just like in the Old Testament, there's the law, there's the commandments, and we haven't kept the commandments, but that doesn't mean the commandments are wrong. It means we're wrong. We fall short of the ideal, but the ideal is still beautiful. The ideal is still what we long for. The ideal is still what God desires for his people. But even Solomon, who who wrote about the ideal, missed it. He missed it. This also reminds us that we, in our own ability, are unable to live up to our own ideals, which this is really good news. And this ties in 
to Palm Sunday and to Easter. Solomon was king and he was unable to live up to his own standard. But Solomon's lineage, David, Solomon, and then after them, hundreds of years later, came Jesus, another king. And Jesus lived this life perfectly. And as he entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and people said, Hosanna, they were, they were understanding that he was a man of authority and a man of power, but really he's not an earthly king. He's the everlasting king. And because we've been unable to live up to our own ideals, this everlasting king, placed himself on the cross so that all of our faults, our failures, our sin, our shame would be placed on him. And those of us who believe in him would be forgiven. And because he walked out of the tomb, we know that he is the king who conquers and gives life. He's different than Solomon. This scripture says that love is as strong as death. The love of Jesus is stronger than death because he's the only one who had the power to overcome death as he walked out of the grave, which also means that he has the power to bring hope into your marriage. If your marriage, it feels as if it's so far from this, he has power to bring life into a relationship that feels dead. If you feel like you've made an absolute mess and you've fallen so short of this, understand, All of us have fallen short and Jesus desires to bring mercy and forgiveness and a fresh start to you. If you've been damaged and hurt because of broken relationships, he desires to bring healing to you. If you are empty and and just at pain because you so badly want a relationship like this and it feels feels so far and impossible, understand that Jesus is the ultimate one for you and that he is committed to you that he loves you and that his love for you is stronger than death. We have people from our church who would love to pray with you. And maybe you're a married couple watching now and you would like to recommit to one another. We're gonna have a number on the screen. You just text that number on the screen and we'll have a group of people who are gonna be ready to pray with you. Perhaps you would like some healing and want to experience God's forgiveness and grace in your life, you can text that number as well. We would love to pray with you today. Jesus, I pray for your people. I pray that you would overwhelm them with your mercy and your grace, and that you would remind them how you are for them and committed to them. It's in your name I pray, amen. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, He is my song. Let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, He is my song, cause you are good. Let the king of my heart be the wind. 
never gonna see you too good I know that you you're never gonna let you're never gonna let me down your faithful God you're never gonna let you're never gonna let me down I believe in Lord you're never gonna let you're never gonna let me down you're I'm so glad that you joined us for our service today. And I hope and pray that God used this message to encourage you right where you are. I'd love if you hit the subscribe button because then you could get the next alert for whenever we have services and whenever we ever offer content here on YouTube. So subscribe and join us for Mariners Online.